Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, taking issue with the final installments of Tom King's final arc on Final Man. I, I mean, oh, you saw the title, you know who I mean. Last time, we discovered how Flashpoint Thomas Wayne spent his time as Batman, suffered numerous losses, ended up in the main DC Universe, and joined up with Bane to torment his son into leaving the cape behind. Now, it all boils down to one last rematch between cross-dimensional father and son. Issue 85's cover sees Bats standing triumphant over Bane, as his allies stand behind him. Kind of misleading, since he was taken out a couple issues ago, but hey, I guess it avoids spoilers. Once again, I'm going against the non-linear order of the story, because it's just easier to review more chronologically. Just like their tactics on Santa Prisca, on Batsy's signal, Catwoman catches Thomas's throat with her whip, then delivers a flying kick to his back. Holding him down, she notes how she was left alone with the powerful Psycho Pirate and the Ventriloquist, the one person he nor anyone can control, save one. It's revealed that Bruce left more than Super Venom with the Memory of the Mountain. He'd left the Scarface doll as well, Tom apparently never considering where the puppet was this whole time. I assumed, like anyone would, Bruce sold him off to Jeff Dunham for a stand-up act. She shows off Scarface's eye, which speaks to berate Arnold. And I'm just not sure what this reveal is supposed to mean. First off, Whisker seemed pretty controlled while acting as butler to Flashpoint Batman. Heck, I thought that was the point of those swirly monitors. Furthermore, I'm not sure how leaving Catwoman alone with these two is any kind of advantage. Pirate could still control her if he wanted or was ordered to. Heck, why didn't he do that, since Tom said he controlled her last issue? If Wesker was somehow stopping him from controlling Selina, what was stopping Pirate from telling Thomas? Since the story never specifies, I guess we have to assume Wesker did something to help Batman and Catwoman out in exchange for Scarface. Perhaps it's an oversight, or they want your headcanon to be your guide. The old man is ticked at his lackey, but his attack is deflected by a bat punch to the face. He concedes his loss, complimenting his boy who would not fall after being pushed so badly. He's a Wayne after all. Then pulls a gun from, I don't know, his shirt sleeve and puts it to Batman's head. And Waynes, we, we rise. We're also filled to the brim with carbohydrates. Our family is basically bread dough. Yeah, we've already seen a point-blank bullet to the head barely do anything to Brucey before, so unless you somehow switched his cowl for a less armored one... I fail to see the threat. He rambles about how he lived in pain so Bruce could be happy with Selina, that the mask was useless, and that he's not Batman. Must have missed those lessons when you were stalking, torturing, and attacking him there, dude. Bruce mentions his attempt at suicide, though instead took a vow, which he recites to Thomas. He's lived by that vow ever since, saying that life isn't a trap you set when you're a hurt child, but a choice you make every day. So he chooses all of it. Selina, happiness, family, and Batman. Thomas lowers the weapon, saying how he killed a universe, so many people including Alfred, and burned Gotham for his boy, and wonders when he'll listen to his father. Bats says that he did listen, and knows what Tom did but needs him to know, after a solid and well-deserved punch to the face, that the old man is not his father. You don't even have a mustache! How did I not see that before? Hey, since you're slugging terrible alternate versions of characters... Just saying, she's just in the other room. Tom is remanded to Arkham, all hand-lectored like Selina was when she was on the hook for murdering terrorists. Bats visits, thinking about them, all killing joke-like, and says he still talks to his in-universe parents daily, often asking them if they're proud of him. At some point, you gotta wonder why he doesn't just ask Dead Man, Dr. Fate, or Zatanna to have a little chat. Does he not have Zoriel on its speed dial anymore, after all the reboots and retcons? In fact, evil mirror universe pappy may be the only one who really understands what Bruce is doing, having similarly suffered loss, and knows what it's like, having to spend one's days trying to fill the silence, waiting for an answer. It was either dress in a costume and fight crime, or spend your day watching soaps and Jeopardy. There is no in-between. Later, Thomas reflects on one particular night, 
after reading his boy The Animals in the Pit, and expresses his worry about Bruce's fixation on that story to his wife. She says he's just finding his way and will be fine, Tom agreeing that he's a good kid. And you can tell this is from Flashpoint, because as I have previously noted, this Martha is blonde and this Thomas has no mustache. It's like reverse Star Trek rules. The lack of facial hair means evil. In the here and now, Bane enters the ward where he's resting, because he must have been shot with one of those brain-avoiding bullets, and when the old man confirms he's done, the bruiser pulls his signature move and breaks his back. He repeatedly calls him Batman, among dialogue that seems to suggest that this was going to be fatal. But it's not, so maybe he was just psyching himself up? Mom, can we get a Batman for me to break? We have Batman at home, dear. The Batman at home. Echoing issue 24, Batman and an apparently depowered Gotham girl are climbing a signal tower. Though given the shortness of her skirt, I hope he's averting his gaze appropriately. Bane used her from the start, but with him gone, her life is hers again, and Bats, feeling responsible, wants to repair the damage she suffered. She insists she's fine after the training she gave him that we never saw, and wants to know what he needs, if not help, figuring this is more about him than he lets on. As they reach the very top, he notes how everyone thinks they know him, but they don't, except for Selina. But with the universe getting rearranged every month, it can honestly be difficult to pin down, I'll admit. He gives her a gift, something he got from Superman a while back, but took time to see what to do with it. Platinum Kryptonite. Introduced a couple years before this in Batman's Secret Files number 1, a single touch will permanently grant someone the same powers as Superman. So the powers she once had will be hers again, with none of the drawbacks of losing her lifespan with each use. He figures that she's a good person after all she's been through. She's a little scared, but of course, that's just an opportunity to be brave. She takes the rock, crackles with energy, and is soon flying again. She asks what they do now, how he thought that he was going to die a good death when they first met, but learned from his father that there are no good deaths, but good lives, so they should try for that instead. I'm going to marathon all of One Piece in a single sitting. Bruce is at Alfred's grave, which notes him as a beloved father and grandfather, and he mentions how he made tea with cucumber sandwiches, ate with the boys, and how they all miss him very much. Selina joins him just as the signal appears in the sky. They go on to tackle various obscure villains seen earlier in the run, reflect fondly on their time in Hawaii, and discuss going through with the wedding. They make it even more last minute than before. It's 4 a.m., Judge Wolfman is probably about to leave the bar, so why not right now? They're about to leave, but Catwoman stops, says she loves him so much, and they make out a little. Later, they're in bed, Selina wearing the ring. But they completely skipped the judge. They can go the next morning, but she suggests that what they do, fighting crime dressed as animals, isn't because they believe in the law, but in something higher than the law. And after all they've endured together, she doesn't need a judge or audience or address, because she knows that the bat and the cat are forever. As long as you're not eternal, associating that word with Batman often does far more harm than good. Nice touch on this two-page spread, not only showing their history that we've seen, but even a glimpse at the future Selina envisioned, the two of them several decades older. Bruce stops into Porky's bar and encounters Charles Brown, a.k.a. Kite Man. They share differing views on the Gotham Knights game, specifically about the performance of Campbell, a player that's been much maligned throughout this run. Wayne thinks there's always hope, even if the guy has already bungled a couple of plays. Yet Charles figures hope gets you killed, and it's better to know the team is gonna lose. Says the guy that keeps on being a supervillain, even though he's really bad at it and always gets caught. Speaking of, why is he out and about? Parole? If he escaped, why is he throwing around his real name in public? They drink to the nights for all the pain and misery their losses bring, and eventually the home team calls their last time out, apparently trying a Hail Mary. It seems to give them a chance, but Charles Brown has seen this before, Campbell getting set up only to lose the ball and end up on his back. It's an excellently subtle and clever reference to Peanuts, given who this guy is named after. They should only be worried if a player named Lucy Van Pelt is involved. Bruce says that stories and people change, but good grief, 
Chuck ain't buying it, saying it's all the same, nothing ends, nothing begins. It's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. However, Wayne suggests that maybe it's enough that Campbell has taken so many hits, gotten knocked down so many times, only to get back up. As Selena joins them, the announcer calls Campbell inexplicably dodging an opposing player, launching the ball to a teammate, and the comic ends with the announcer's incredulity, making it a safe bet the Knights won the game, as the last panel goes completely black. That's right, it was so implausible that Campbell would make a good play that after it happened, the universe just stopped existing. That was City of Bane, and as a conclusion to Tom King's run on Batman, I thought it was pretty strong, hopeful, though left numerous lingering questions. The non-linear style would have made it more difficult to review page by page like I've normally done, but in reading I guess it keeps it from feeling too much like it drags on, given that it has about as many endings as The Lord of the Rings Return of the King. I'd wager that certain plot holes had something to do with King having to leave the title prematurely. Apparently, he was working on a TV project as well as a New Gods movie alongside Ava DuVernay, and couldn't make time for a twice-monthly comic. Perhaps that's why we don't get any resolution on Batsy's alliance with Gordon, which seems to have been renewed given the use of the Bat Signal. Heck, we didn't even get a clue what happened to the GCPD when they were replaced by Arkham residents. Well, <laughs> other than Bullock. You think Clayface was just in character when he was using him as a dartboard? Or that Harv would feel better knowing that it wasn't really the Joker perforating his skin, but someone working with Batman? I am curious how it would have played out, sans Dan DiDio's insistence on killing Alfred. I think Bruce getting word from him in Hawaii could have still been in there as a misdirect to the audience. Perhaps when Thomas went to face Robin, they used the fear gas and just bet that he would see his grandpa figure killed instead of something else. I mean, there was plenty of reliance on luck with Bane's master plan to begin with. Though, if it was supposed to be Clayface swapped with Alfred, he would have to have excused himself as Joker from time to time, which would make things more difficult. Though, even if this is set before the Victim Syndicate exposed the Alliance with the Dark Knight, given that Thomas had access to the back computer and Bane somehow found out about the memory of the mountain, wouldn't they have found out about Clayface being one of his allies too? Maybe found a way to test the Arkham villains to make sure they were flesh and bone? Not to mention other villains having seen Clayface working with the sidekicks. But hey, why not just send Clayface after Thomas and engulf him in clay to take him out? Or would the old bat find a way to take him out of commission off-panel as well? Also, I don't know if Basil ever knew Batman's secret identity. A bunch of other villains did. Yeah, that's another unresolved issue. Ventriloquist and Psychopirate at least know, and I don't think they'd be like Joker and just ignore it because they don't care or something. Heck, Thomas in Arkham is kind of a problem, since he's already shown he's willing to work with supervillains to make his son happy by trying to kill him. I get that some might see the alter-ego aspect of superheroes silly or unnecessary, even unrealistic, despite all the unrealistic stuff in this run alone. But too many people are just casually finding out the legendary Batman is a rich orphan with unresolved emotional issues, and it doesn't seem like a big deal, there's no impact. If it doesn't matter to the characters of the world, if it's not going to be addressed, why have it? There's also Thomas's sudden connection to Gotham Girl. Maybe he was reminded of his world's Selina, but given that he seemed willing to kill Bane because of what he did to her, it seems quite out of nowhere. Perhaps with more breathing room, the writer could have clarified some of these details, but I think there were other oversights less related to his schedule. For one, did we ever really get to know Claire Clover? At first, she's following her brother's lead, gets instilled with fear, goes a little loopy, and after she's allegedly cured, we hardly see her again before she's working for Bane. We get some exposition that says Batman benched her, contradicted by alleged training mentioned later, and at some point off the page, Bane somehow finds her and maybe gets Pirate to scramble her brains to be evil or something. The only other alternative is that for some reason she was partially working of her own accord. When she was sick and Thomas was caring for her, Perhaps she was running on fumes before Batman could give her the cure he offered Bane. Who, yeah, again, never displayed any of the superpowers associated with Super Venom. Weird, huh? Which is kind of a roundabout way to say, who is Claire? Okay, she wants to help people, great, but we don't get much of her genuine personality because her mind keeps getting messed with, and we have characters just saying, oh yeah, this happened, you just didn't see it. 
Despite that, Bats can tell she's good and responsible enough to have those powers without any drawbacks. So she's an off-brand Supergirl. Yeah, but I think we should do the mega happy ending. Oh, the mega happy ending, that's doable. Whether or not she has weakness to kryptonite, who knows? And who knows when, during the course of this run, that Batman found all this out about Super Venom. The reveal that her powers came from Bane whipping up a special batch of his own steroid felt a little anticlimactic, possibly because there was no explanation beyond being a chemical cocktail. It's just weird that the Bruiser would create a formula that mimics Kryptonian powers from his favorite steroid. Or how he managed it, for that matter. What'd he do, mix Venom with ashwagandha and St. John's wort? And as one of my viewers pointed out, it's even weirder that Amanda Waller, as devious, conniving, cunning, tactical, and exploitative as she is, wouldn't want to somehow get that power-bestowing science juice. Seems like it'd be particularly appealing to someone who runs the Suicide Squad when it can destroy the user the more that it's used. You'd think she'd at least recruit the Gothams, get a sample of their blood, and go from there. They were there to help Gotham City, after all, which was her whole mission with Strange and Pirate to begin with. Though, if this whole thing was orchestrated by Bane from the beginning, wouldn't that mean The Wall got played by a roid-raging nudist dictator? She couldn't be too happy about that. But maybe it was the very instability of that Venom that would make her think twice. Moving on, I feel like the Allies got nerfed in their fight with Flashpoint Bats. It's largely off-panel, but what we do see suggests that he beats them hand-to-hand. -hand. If he had actually used some gadgetry, that would explain it, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It was also kind of a missed opportunity to see them get beat down, only to get back up over the course of the fight. Because Wayne's rise and all that, solidifying how Bruce's surrogate family is a stronger bond than, well, interdimensional blood. But it does exemplify my stance that Orphan really is a weaker version of Cassandra Cain, so I'll take that as the silver lining. I'm still confused what that Scarface reveal was supposed to be. I know I didn't skip any pages reading it, so did Selina use the eyeball to coerce Wesker into helping her and Bats? If so, how? What did he do that helped them in any way? And why would Pirate not have controlled Selina when she was brought to the mansion? The old man's dialogue suggested he'd done that already with Damien and the others, hence them just standing around. Now, how does this run stack up as a whole? Forgive me if I'm sounding long-winded, but this will require some brief recaps from the beginning. If Tom King can get away with being non-linear and repeating himself, so can I. I Am Gotham sees how possessive Batman is of his city, the extents he'll go to to tackle threats alone, even telling actual superheroes, via Alfred, he can handle a crashing plane. When it looks like he can't, he at least hopes it's a good death. Then along come these newbies, with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal man and woman, even those dressed as winged mammals. They understand and care for Gotham and want to help, like Bruce's mission mixed with Clark Kent's idealism, and maybe they can carry on when Wayne is gone, a kind of out for him that assures Gotham's safety. But when Hank is driven mad, another threat he can't survive, Bruce is again saved by another's power to match it. Early on, Batman's need to rely on others is foisted upon him, from these young heroes to requiring villains to infiltrate Santa Prisca in I Am Suicide, as well as those he can trust, in particular Catwoman. However, as he knew she was lying about killing over 200 people, that trust is possibly tested, though not so much to prevent his confession of once contemplating self-termination, from the despair of losing his parents. How he felt, at the time, his vow was a kind of end to his life, because he felt he'd lost everything. His vulnerabilities, where Selina are concerned, are exemplified in rooftops, where he fails to bring her in because of a rooftop tryst, and that gets him knifed across the neck by Holly Robinson, the true mass killer. Yeah, remember Holly? Because Tom King didn't after issue 50. But hey, unstable woman that knows Batman's identity, no big deal. Maybe that's also why he didn't object to her as Selina's maid of honor, murder attempt notwithstanding. I Am Bane, for all its questionable passage of time, has someone as tactical and driven as Bats seek revenge and restitution, and as battered as the Dark Knight gets, his allies and loved ones in danger, he refuses to yield, because Claire needed help, and that was more important than a muscular lunatic's demands. And maybe, in defiance of his notion that his vow was a form of suicide, he notes how often he's been threatened with death, and yet, I'm still here. The button offers an emotional trial, as a token from some version of his father is taken from him, 
and he actually meets the man who wrote it. Perhaps his recent experiences, reminding him of his parents, like bonding with Claire over needing to talk to his mom, made Bruce quicker to accept a gun-toting grizzled variant of his own dad. Thus, he begins taking his advice to heart. Be happy. Don't be Batman. So, since his caped life hasn't offered the happiness he'd apparently intended, he proposed to one of the very few people who could understand him, love him for all his faults. Even when he feels that, when pushed to his limits, as in his early days during the uh, yuck brain teaser kerfuffle, he may not be so different from the monsters he confronts. They both took turns deriding the vow he took as a child, though Selina would consider it a higher priority to him than she, a feeling she had accepted, yet still sought to help him enjoy himself on a double date, and trusted him when he was away for a very long time with another attractive woman. While he probably won't reach the notoriety of villains such as the Joker or Penguin, Matthew Warner has the potential to be a good occasional foil, a grim example of aspiring to be like someone else instead of being your own unique person. It's a tad odd that he'd consider Bruce Wayne a sick kid with dead parents like himself, since he only knows his public face of a wealthy, generous businessman. Though if Matt went through the mental gymnastics of renaming himself Master Bruce, it's possible he'd make some attempts on Wayne's life to actually supplant him. Throughout much of these issues, there's emphasis that nothing is impossible where Pointy Ears is concerned, coupled with him saying, I know, in response to whatever mission he's on or the details thereof. Yet when Ivy conquered the world, he began saying, I don't know, showing a chip in his armor of preparedness that things are getting too big for him and he's losing his vaunted omnipresence slash control. And it's only with the aid of someone else, Selina, that he returns things to normal. The Gift at least attempted to demonstrate that a world where Bruce emphasized his own happiness could end in ruin. The one would think Bruce, who would be aware of alternate timelines, different realities, would figure that there are other dimensions where he either found the balance he sought or was never Batman and things were fine. Frankly, it doesn't really work to show that he can't be a happy bat because that world was one where he was content for decades and suddenly faced all this personal tragedy, whereas he's trying to be happier in a world where he's already made his mark. They really don't seem all that comparable when you think about it. It'd be like comparing apples to chalk, water to the number seven, or Cassandra Cain to Orphan. Boom! Got in another one. <laughs> also, consider this. Bruce Wayne is not Batman. He's cooped up inside all the time. Not doing anything about the world falling apart outside. Focused solely on his parents. Sounds an awful lot like what Flashpoint Thomas expected of him, doesn't it? Nevertheless, the same seed of doubt needed to be planted in Selina. This is done in The Best Man, through an old associate with his own perception of the Dark Knight, which perhaps was given more weight than I think it deserved. The wedding arrives and... she leaves, causing a heartbreak Bruce hadn't really felt before. Yes, he's dated various women, deeply cared for them, maybe even loved them, but it was established that Selina was... unique. This was a hurt that reverberated for others, like Mr. Freeze in Cold Days, who feared for his life because he was thought to have committed a crime of which he was innocent. However, quick to realize his oversight, Wayne sought to demystify his nocturnal persona to everyday citizens, whom he'd saved in one way or another. He even confessed Batman saved him, perhaps an early sign that, despite his fiancé leaving, there was hope in that old vow. He still felt this was a pain he had to deal with solo, like everything else, but Nightwing, his oldest and closest ally besides Alfred, shows that needn't be the case. All the more tragic when Bane ups his game, has Grayson shot, testing the caped crusader's stability and ethics even further. One of the rogues under the brute's thumb is allowed to give away the game, at least what he knows, causing Batman to lash out further, even at Gordon, which dissolves his alliance with law enforcement. His city has been taken from him, and he's losing support. Yet he feels no need to explain his enhanced interrogation of released Arkham inmates, that he can, must, should, or deserves to handle it all by himself. All to be in control, such as allegedly benching Gotham Girl, leading her to fall under Bane's sway in The Price. Again, his lone wolf attitude has bitten him and others where the moon don't shine. So many times he mentions that he's Batman, the world's greatest detective, citing his accomplishments and victories, capable of the impossible, 
he's increasingly buying into his own hype, like the Lego Batman movie, without the whimsy and only a little less singing. After being surprised in his own cave, he's faced with fear gas-induced hallucinations, nightmares that hit more emotionally than being hunted by a scary monster or trapped in some manner. He faces stuff like that in his waking life before breakfast. He's lost, hurt, and doesn't know what to do, and the way out isn't as easy as speaking backwards or waving a wand. No, he needs to face the idea that Selena left because he may not love her at least as much as he said. That he feels his vow to war on crime is more important, something she picked up on. But because this time he really can't rely on others to help, he finds a way to escape this dream prison. So his solo attitude was actually beneficial. His own tactic of using an entire asylum on an opponent is used against him, and he rallies his allies in The Fall and the Fallen, this time declaring that they'll take their city back. Yet his foes are one step ahead of him, making it seem as if heartbreak is making him lose control. He appears to lash out at another ally, he challenges his foe again, loses again, and is offered by his supposed father to have a family again. He's lost, he's fallen, but he rises, defying the ends Thomas's demands, given the means he resorted to in order to reach them. Bruce goes to the ends of the earth to enact his plan to save his city, again alone, even though you'd think he'd have asked one of his allies to join him since they had to stay out of Gotham anyway. But hey, pesky common sense, who needs it? He nearly dies, if not for the woman he loves finding him, hiding and healing him, and preparing them both for the challenge yet to come. The room service, the lavish food, the on-demand massages, all very crucial to his rehabilitation. He officially admits in this tropical haven, where they're safe and comfortable, that he can't do this alone anymore, and they leave paradise to take back a city the country doesn't care about, with no objection when Selina calls it hers, that it belongs to the stray, the downtrodden, those who struggle and fight to survive. The ownership of Gotham has loosened, expanded over time in Bruce's mind. Just when Bane faces his latest humiliation, and thank goodness he kept his pants on this time, Thomas Wayne usurps both his and Bruce's victory at the barrel of a gun. This whole time he's considered his son's crusade a game played by children, that his boy needs to listen to the elder that knows what's best for him. He apparently hasn't quite let go of that image of his son as a ten-year-old, in need of strict, if violent, guidance. On top of the condescension, the abuse of lessons, he does away with Bruce's other dad, the one that encouraged his plight, arguably coddled and spoiled him in that regard, desperate to force a single, batch-free path for his son. Yet it was Alfred's final message that perhaps helped reinforce the Dark Knight's fortitude, a poem about the imagination and innocence of childhood, that the vow previously derided by even Bruce himself was his way of transforming his pain into hope, driving him to become a force that has saved lives in the city and across the world, that he has a good life, and he need not look for a good end to it. Then, closing on another poem, by the same scribe, about death perhaps not being as cruel as popularly perceived, bookending his pride in his surrogate son with artistic perspectives of life's beginnings and conclusions. Say, didn't Alfred have a biological daughter? Anyone tell her about this yet? Or did everyone just keep responding not it when they were asked who'd call Julia Pennyworth? And so, in final defiance of the man trying to establish himself not just as his father, but as his superior and authority figure, almost as he's seen fit to make himself to others, Bruce renounces the Thomas Wayne of another, darker world. Despite his own losses, his own trials, he rejects the idea that he can't find happiness and still be a force for good on his terms, refuses such restrictions placed upon him. So he helps the girl who wanted to be a hero, he commits to the woman he loves, even if they didn't go through with the ceremony, and meets with one of his nighttime enemies, one who also donned a costume after a tragic death, and inspires him to believe things can get better, that it's possible, even for everyone's least favorite football player, to get knocked down over and over and rise to the occasion. Perhaps like a kite in a sudden updraft? Themes of tragedy and triumph, conquering adversity, facing one's limitations, admitting to fears and faults. While it was quite the long road to take it all in, I'd say that Tom King did more than a respectable job. Really good, in fact. I know a lot of people didn't care for it, and I can see why, but I think he did far better than others I could name. 
which isn't to say there weren't some potholes and cracks in the pavement. We see contradictions here and there, like whether or not Gotham Girl was trained or sidelined, a few missing details that could have been cleared up, in particular Bats and Bane losing fights on purpose, and everything each did was part of the plan. And for that matter, the Luchador's master plan specifically depended so much on luck and stuff we read that didn't seem to fit later on, like Bane's pursuit to be happy. It doesn't work if he was controlling things from issue one. I thought it was weird the way he spoke in frequent pauses. It made sense if he was struggling to keep from getting emotional about his nightmares or the urge to go back to using Venom, but other times it felt more like, well, he was about to yell, King did have a habit of repeating dialogue which, again, like Bane's pauses, felt appropriate in some places more than others, but at times bordered on feeling fillery. He did a much better job with interpersonal moments between characters than Detective Comics during Rebirth, not just with Batman and Catwoman, as annoying as the whole Bat-Cat thing could be, but stuff with the Robins like squabbling at Batburger, or Ace and Jason fighting over a coat and the dog just rubbing his back on it as if in a kind of victory dance, with his drool being a bit of salt on the wound. Though, as I've stated, I didn't care for King's retcon of Bane's history closely paralleling Bruce's life, and of course I'm no fan of killing off Alfred, though I will admit his last goodbye was genuinely heartfelt. When I did my thought experiment to fix Rebirth Detective Comics, the v Act Howard changed the events of this run. Now that I've actually read through 80 plus issues, I'll say that most of what I would do is fill in some gaps and tweak some inconsistencies. Even as is, this could fit in a pre-Flashpoint context with little alteration. I would have the Falling Plane be part of Hugo Strange's plan to test and study Batman, with the Gothams arriving out of nowhere as an X-Factor. Since he seemed to be operating outside of Waller's notice anyway, somehow, he could be enlisted by her to use Psycho Pirate for the whole fix Gotham thing, and while preparing him, he's contacted by Bane. He's been looking for Pirate and genuinely wants to be happy, leave Gotham, Batman, and all related madness behind to rule his prison and or island. But people feel pain too. Needing Venom for his Monster Men formula, Strange agrees, having Pirate mess with the Gotham's heads to cover his tracks, or at least distract Bats and Waller for a while. Things play out much the same. Hank dies, but perhaps the Medusa Mask is the only thing that can safely undo Claire's condition. Or maybe Batman's I gotta do everything mindset is why he didn't call Jean or another trusted telepath, fitting with the established themes of him doing everything himself. Whether using villains or his own allies, he invades Santa Prisca, takes Pirate before his therapy on Bane is finished, and the Bruiser, who was totally willing to live the rest of his life without thinking about bats, having conquered the jail he grew up in, now finds his foe has treated him just like any other Gotham nutjob, spitting on the sanctity of his dominion. This disrespect drives him back to Venom, back to revenge, and we get the events of I Am Bane. However, his loss isn't part of some grand plan, he just lost the battle because he lost control. So he sits in Arkham, contemplating, planning, getting information about Batman from the outside, learning of his engagement, while events like Everybody Loves Ivy and The Gift play out independent of him, because Bane wanting to dabble in time travel just makes things a bit too far-fetched and risky. He does arrange for Nightwing to be shot, Gotham Girl to be coerced or manipulated to his side, probably by Pirate again, and even accepts the unexpected aid of a mysterious other Batman claiming to be Bruce's dad. Rather than two competing I planned for every detail scenarios, both opponents basically lose and try again. And to be more cohesive, maybe show a little bit of Claire's training, maybe specify that Bruce was thinking of keeping her busy with it longer than normal to keep her from the caped life, trying to lead her to the conclusion to quit that he wanted, which later creates a parallel with Flashpoint Thomas that he doesn't like and thoroughly renounces. Also, I would show what happened to the cops, like they got locked up in Arkham. Bats and Gordon make peace, if with some lingering tension, mention how the city's superhero ban was lifted after Bane's defeat and not looked too kindly on by Gothamites, and make it work without tertiary villains finding out Batman's secret identity. This all would require a different origin for what gave the Gothams their powers, but you could still have Batman look into it and find out how to cure it. It could be an unrelated villain doing experiments, or maybe... A wizard did it. Overall, Tom King's tenure on the title had its ups and downs, some redundancies and conveniences, as well as a few plot holes. 
but more than other stories in recent years, it actually made me think about what it was trying to say, rather than actively trying to keep me from thinking. I get why a lot of people didn't like it, and in some cases, I might even agree. But as deconstructions go, it's actually a far better go at it than I've seen in a while. That's it for the season, and I thank you for watching. Hopefully I'll see you again for another season. God bless, and I'm the Angry Spork, and man have I got issues. Thank you.